Well, hi, everyone. I'm Lori LeBay, and welcome to Dementia in the Arts. Today, our featured artist is Mark Timmons, and I can't wait to have our conversation with him. Uh, but before we talk with Mark, uh, I'm just going to introduce myself briefly. Again, Lori LeBay. The reason Dementia in the Arts exists is because my mom lived with dementia for 30 years, and I stepped into this space in 2009 as a frustrated uh, daughter. Uh, and created Alzheimer's Speaks to raise everyone's voice, especially those diagnosed with dementia and the family members, and to try to shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. We do partner with Dementia Action Alliance, known as DAA, um, who has wonderful support programs, um, very creative regarding uh, people living with dementia, as well as Forget Me Not, which is a Facebook page created by Harry Urban, and Dementia Map, which is our uh, global resource directory under Alzheimer's Speaks. I'm going to have Mary Crescenzo, my co-host, introduce herself to you, and then we'll go to Mark and we'll get rolling with this program. Mary? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I am Mary Crescenzo, co-host of Dementia and the Arts. I am the author of The Planet Alzheimer's Guide, Eight Ways the Arts Can Transform the Life of Your Loved One and Your Own. I'm playwright of Planet A about the inner world of dementia. Um, I'm a writer as well, poet as Mark is, and um, I'm also a speaker, public speaker, and I do workshops in self-care for create in with creative writing for caregivers. Great. Thanks, Mary. Mark, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Uh, thank you, Laurie. And, and I'm thrilled to be here today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so my name is Mark Timmons. Um, I am a photographer. I'm a poet. And through my uh, affiliation with the Dementia Action Alliance, I'm also um, a mentor and an advocate um, for people living with dementia, as well as the work I do outside of DAA for advocating for mental health and homelessness. Okay, wonderful. Now, can you tell people, are you comfortable sharing um, when you got diagnosed and what type of diagnosis that you received? Sure, I should have mentioned that. Um, I was diagnosed eight years ago at the age of 48. At th that time, um, my diagnosis was early onset dementia, most probably Alzheimer's type. Since then, uh, by my count, I can I can um, remember my diagnosis having been changed at least six times. Wow. Um, I tend to be a very um, complex um, case for <laughs> for the neurologists. So at this point, they're they're simply calling it mixed dementia until more symptoms, more evidence shows up so that, that they can narrow it down as to which type of dementia I'm dealing with. You know, that seems to be a really common game that the physicians are playing these days. And I say playing a game yeah. because to family members and those diagnosed, that's what it feels like. It's, it's like either give me a diagnosis or don't or start out with that. And, and, and educate people that this is a difficult thing to do um, because what I've seen from people is there's so much trauma wrapped every time the diagnosis changes. You know, you think you got it down and then you have to kind of re-research and stuff. Um, and all that stress does not help, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with any form of dementia. I'd like to ask too, Mark, have you always been an artist, you know, all of your life? Or is this something that you know, you took up later on or, or really jumped into once your dementia uh, diagnosis kicked in? Well, with the photography, um, it was something I dabbled in for many, many years, but it was never anything I was serious about. Um, uh, poetry came, came a little later. Poetry only came in the last couple of years. Um, but what I found what I discovered was happening with with my brain change is that while um, the analytical side of my brain was was suffering due to uh, was becoming more and more compromised due to the dementia um, 
the the creative side of my brain sort of woke up and um, found myself able to to do more on the creative side of of life um you know as my my analytical skills deteriorated okay and do you mind also sharing what you did prior? I'm assuming, um, and maybe I'm incorrect in this, but I'm assuming that you don't work anymore. What kind of work? That's you did correct. Um, I don't work anymore. Uh, prior to my diagnosis, I was a um, fiduciary tax accountant for one of the big four accounting firms. Um, I handled a bank of accounts uh, somewhere be, somewhere between four and 5,000 trust accounts that I maintained throughout the year for a bank, a, a customer of ours that was a bank and was responsible for the all the um, tax, pay, calculating the tax payments and processing the tax forms, uh, whether they be trust accounts, estates or charitable entities for, for this client. So definitely hands-on and, and something that you really have to have straight focus for to meet all those government guidelines and, and that was and that was um how i real when i started to realize uh, that something wasn't right in my brain was um the sudden and quick um deterioration of the quality of my work in the accounting field um was kind of set off the the alarm in my head that that there was something something not right going on in my head the idea of the mixed dementia diagnosis. I think that you're hearing more and more of that because um, I had heard when I was at recently at the conference, the Alzheimer's dementia, I'm sorry, not, yes, Alzheimer's dementia, dementia International Conference, esteemed doctors from all over the world, neuroscien neuroscientists, et cetera, spoke. And they were saying that they were admitting, admittedly, that the diagnosis is often wrong. Yeah. And so you're putting somebody in a box of one sort of dementia. And so they are now leading themselves towards saying, let's do a mixed type of diagnosis, admit that basically they're not sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is becoming more and more prominent and only to the, I think, um, to help the patient understand that they don't quite understand. And so therefore, how can we quite understand until they come closer to something for us instead of directing us in one way? Right. Um, the other thing you mentioned was how your the creativity started uh, increasing. And I think um, the use of the amygdala, which is the emotional part of the brain, is a direct connection to the creative side of the brain. Okay. And often when the other areas are not uh, functioning as well that one kind of takes takes a bigger uh front uh, not front in the brain because it's not in the front it's in the back but um takes a more prominent sense of uh what we our consciousness and it allows for even more creativity for people who have never done any art at all will find themselves creating because indeed we all have that creative spirit in us Mm -hmm. But um, for whatever reason, it's not there. So that, I think, is something else that I'm glad you mentioned so people will understand that that is an important part of looking towards a creative source for satisfaction, dignity, and uh, self self um, esteem. And it's, it's all about having a purpose. And that's um, something very important that... Um, um, that we that we present to people in DAA is is um, helping people living with dementia find a new purpose in life. And um, one thing I like to say, I do I do a lot of public speaking locally and with DAA. And one of the analogies I like to I like to use when I talk is that. Um, you know, the, the diagnosis of dementia wasn't the end of my story, or and it's not necessarily the end of anybody's story, it's just the end of a chapter. So for my life, the chapter called Mark the Tax Accountant is over with. But I turn the page and there's more chapters to be written for my story. Mark the photographer, Mark the advocate, Mark the poet. Those are still 
chapters that, that are, are waiting to be written. And those are, uh, these are areas where I find my purpose now. And we Absolutely. try to help and we try to help other people find their purpose so that they can turn the page and continue to live, live well with dementia. Thank I you. love that because I think so many times, like even when somebody retires, they don't know who they are anymore mm -hmm. and really saying, hey, this is just a chapter in your life, you know, um, flip the page, see what's next. What do you want to create? And and you have a choice in what that's going to look like. And that's one of the fun things that Mary and I um, really enjoy in doing this program is seeing the creativity of what people can bring to the table many times thinking it was never possible because they never saw themselves as a creative. And now there's this whole other piece that they didn't really even know existed or that they were capable of doing. And so often with dementia, you're told you're not capable to do this. And, and I really feel like our program helps bust that stigma and go, okay, you try this. Look at what right. they're doing. It's pretty cool. Right. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So very fun. Um, now you said you kind of dabbled in um, photography originally. What does dabble mean to you? Because that means different things to different people. When, when I got out of high school and took my first semester of college, I had a one semester course in photography. Um, that's really all the formal training I had in photography. Um, dabbling was, you know, pick up a camera for a period of time, but then kind of get bored with it. Or, you know, life gets in the way of, of frivolous hobbies. And so I'd have to put the camera away. And um, so I guess to answer your question, there wasn't a consistency with me, it, it, with me in photography. It was... It was just something that I would do um, out of convenience when time allowed. Okay. Well, I know we had um, like Gail Gregory on here and she pretty much gets up every morning, goes for a walk, has her camera with her. And she just, that's her routine. That's how she starts out a peaceful day kind of in nature. Do you have a, a routine like that that you do? Uh, not, not like that anymore. No. Um, um Unfortunately, it, I, having some progression with my symptoms and, and um, it's not always safe for me to leave the house on my own two feet by myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm at risk for falling now. Um, I do occasionally uh, wander. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I need to be more careful with uh, leaving the house that being said, you know, if I'm going anywhere with a friend or that involves being outdoors, yet my camera is like another part of my body. You know, I'll, I'll always have my camera with me. Well, thanks for sharing that, because I think it's really important for people to understand how you adapt, you know, um, in life as as uh, symptoms change with that. I think what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to put up a PowerPoint and then Mary and I will just ask you some questions about different sure. pieces and we'll go from there. So Mary, do you want to start us off with this one? I immediately feel peace when I look at this photograph mm -hmm. and it's, it's almost shot painterly the way you use the light for a minute, I thought this is a painting. Um, and your technique in the photography just gives me both of those feelings. Um, it's beautiful. The composition is beautiful. The balance, uh, the light, uh, the, the angle of the light. I love this. Did you use a special kind of lens for this? Or, no, uh, no, it was a standard lens, Mary. Um, wow. first, first of all, thank you for the compliments. Um, and, and you'll notice, or maybe I'm not sure if, if it's well represented in the shots I sent over to you, Laurie, but um, lighthouses are, are a, a magnet to me and my camera. Um, 
my the the logo for my photography um, gallery incorporates a lighthouse in it because um, to me I call my photography haven haven photography ha or haven gallery um, a lighthouse is a haven during a storm for the boats and I look at photography as my haven when uh, when I'm dealing with my dementia day in and day out. Um, you know, I may forget people's names, forget people's faces, forget to turn the stove off. Yeah, I've done that a few times um, in the kitchen, but I can pick up my, still can pick up my camera and know just how I need to set up the settings to get the shot that I'm looking for. I can still imagine a photograph uh, without my camera by looking at it and with my own eyes and, and picturing what it would look like as a photograph. Um, you mentioned uh, the angles, Mary, and, and um, I think I did this with this photo. I'm not positive, but I'll tell when I have an opportunity to, to uh, teach a little photography, if I'm out on a shoot, for my own benefit, but somebody's with me to kind of take their own snapshots and, and keep me safe. Um, the two things, two, two lessons I try to get across to them is don't always take your, have your camera here taking a picture, change your angle, get down on your knees and angle your camera up. And don't forget Every now and then, stop where you walk, stop the direction that you're walking, and just turn around. And there might be a, a, a view of something from that angle that you're walking right right past. So it is a lot of it is all about angles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And what the words you said about a haven, my first reaction, as I said, was peace. And yeah. without words, you're saying this, even though it almost looks like there's a storm come, perhaps coming in that lighthouse just grounds me mm -hmm. and without words you, and now with sharing the words on this, you've, you've captured exactly what you said as you described it. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, as Mary was describing using her words, you know, with the peacefulness and you say in Haven to me, what came was guidance, calmness, safety, not alone, comfort, which to me are all key things that people are looking for when they're dealing with dementia. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, to me, it's kind of this pillar of strength, just, you know, to bringing light to a dark situation, mm -hmm. which is really pretty, pretty beautiful there in and of itself. I know some, I know somebody's watching and they're saying, where is this? <laughs> Can you tell us? This is in Situate, Massachusetts not far from, from where I live. Um, and that is Situate Harbor. And that lighthouse is known as the old Situate light. And and what type of camera do you use? So many people now are like, well, I just use my, my iPhone, you know, type thing, but I know you have a real camera. So what, what type of uh, camera do you use? I use a Nikon uh, DSLR. Um, it's an older model, 30, 3100 or 3200. Um, I haven't outgrown its capabilities yet, so why why put down the money to to buy the new and brightest if this one is is filling my needs just fine? I'd rather spend more money on quality lenses than upgrading the body of the camera. Exactly. So here's a lighthouse again. Well, you want to tell us where this one is and what you were drawn to in this? Before I moved here to Maine, um, I was living up in, I mean, before I moved here to Massachusetts, I was living up in Maine, um, way up the coast of Maine, almost into uh, Canada, in a little little town called East Machias. Mm -hmm. And this lighthouse and the surrounding ground was uh, my favorite go-to spot, you know, my favorite haven. Um, uh, whether it was for photography or just for peace of mind. And this lighthouse is uh, called the West Quaddy Lighthouse, and it's in Lubeck, Maine. Um, it was put into service, I believe, in 1814 by President Jefferson. 
Um, and on the opposite side, that island you see in the background is uh, actually part of Canada, part of New Brunswick. And opposite on an, at an on another angle, opposite this lighthouse is the East Quadi lighthouse. And that one is um, on um, Campobello Island, which is Canadian, a Canadian island. So the two of them are on either side of, of these narrows um, to, to protect the ships at night. Um, Mary, any comments from you on this one? Well, you, know, you mentioned you're a poet and each of your photographs that I've just seen have their own poetic stories. I mean, I want to know how you caught that. Is that a hawk or an eagle? That is an eagle. <laughs> were you standing there a long time or was this? That was pure luck. There, I knew there were eagles. Uh, there, I knew there were a few eagles nests in that area. Um, but this, that was pure luck that he was flying through the frame. And then it also speaks of freedom. Mm -hmm. freedom to create, freedom to be in this new chapter. It's just beautiful. Thank you. Now, I'm noticing something, um, it, like if you go to the lighthouse and if you go up from the bottom up to the third red stripe um, and kind of the red in the water, there's something. Is that a buoy, an animal? Mm -hmm. or that's, that's a buoy. It is. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just, it's very peaceful. And I, I love the, the softness and yet, you know, the um, kind of stand tall, stand strong of the lighthouse with mm -hmm. that. And then the, the wusp of the, of the eagle there. Let's see. Here's another one. This is absolutely gorgeous. This um, photo, I get the most it's probably the one I'm most proud of in, in of my portfolio, and it does get a lot of comments. That's the same lighthouse um, as the last one we just looked at, the West Quadi Lighthouse. The bright spot in the middle is a full moon. Oh. I, I was able to achieve this effect uh, by attaching a star filter to the end of my lens, which takes any bright light source and creates the uh, six star, six pointed star effect. Okay. Wow. And that was, if you look down bottom right, you can sort of see the silhouette of a, of a flag in motion. Um, so to, to get this shot, it was at night. You can still, you can see stars behind the moon. Um, I needed a, to set this up on a tripod for a, for a long exposure. Um, that one was probably a 30 or 40 second exposure to get this, to get this shot. That's wow. Boring. And the flag looks like it's in half mast unless there's one behind it. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure. This, that photo is from probably around 2017. So details like that I, I i don't recall anymore okay beautiful Thank okay you. let's go on to the next one here oh yes the cactus so well you want to explain where you are with this one sure the, the before i moved to maine uh, i had spent the last eight years the prior eight years living in arizona it was in arizona at the barrows neurological institute that i was initially diagnosed um so this is this is a cactus out in arizona but what's uh different about this photo is the background that's not the background that was shot on the original photo hmm. you mentioned um um we talked earlier about the gallery shows that i have i have at least one gallery show a year i always try to um, learn a new technique, incorporate a new technique each year. So, um, yeah, so I can have something new to talk about it at the shows, but also it's to challenge my brain to learn something new, you know, to keep, to keep 
the processes, the neurological processes going in my brain. So with this photo, I call I call this style of this style of photography um, hybrid photography. I take a photo and alter it in 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 editing um, by adding or deleting components of the photograph and replacing them with components that weren't there to begin with. And that that fire sky background is something I added to the photo once I got it back into into my editing program. It's beautiful. Very nice. Very nice. Two powerful images together. And this is the famous Suero cactus, cacti, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. You see in the desert, there's a barren area, but then it's like people. They remind me of people raising their arms up in the air to the sky. Just it's beautiful and also powerful. And the in a in a in a Sekiro, if I'm saying that correctly, uh that large, it's extremely old. It's at least a couple of hundred years old. And here's the next one. And you've um you've overlaid a, one of your poems on this one. So why don't you tell us where this is and, and what this one's about? This was taken um down in the outer banks of North Carolina um two years ago almost to the day, uh, two years ago, in an area called Jockey's Ridge, um, down on the Outer Banks. And like I mentioned with the last photograph, that um, always trying to learn something new and have something new to offer at my each year at my galleries. So two years ago, it was the start of that hybrid photography that I that I talked about this year for the first time, I learned how to superimpose excerpts from my poems onto my photographs. Mm -hmm. And this is an example of that. It's the, the entire poem is, is longer than that, but, um, but I did pull an excerpt from, from the poem, applied it to this photograph and, um, you know, I'll hand right now they're they're being promoted as sort of a limited edition. I sign them and number them in the corner. Um and and they've been quite popular. Yeah, the, the scenery is beautiful and the poem for those that are maybe listening on a podcast. Um, I'll just read this quick. It's uh, it's titled The Gentle Winds. Through an open window I fly, holding hands with the wind, pulled up to the sky. The wind, she takes me to where I long to be. She knows the way to the edge of the sea. With a gentle draft, she sets me down, alone on a beach that has yet to be found. Sand warm and soft, sparkling like diamonds. Ocean stretching out well past the horizon. It's just beautiful. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a calming, beautiful, relaxing picture, but I could, I could just almost feel you know the 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 breeze you know as i was reading that and the and the comfort of that being kind of whisked away to someplace safe and 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 alone where you know the rest of the crazy world <laughs> was <laughs> bombarding me and um so just beautiful mary comments on this one yeah, I, I agree with all that you're saying. And this, the use of putting uh, two different arts together is known as mixed media. And it's a beautiful combination of the two. That was a beautiful reading, by the way, Lori. Oh, <laughs> Very nice. I keep using the word beautiful, but you know, it, it's so apt here. Um, mm -hmm. I love it. The composition, the feeling, it's, it's lovely. One of the things too that stuck out with me too is you know, you've got this this white beach sand and some of it is smooth and then you see the footprints. But what my eyes are really drawn to is the fence. The fence, yeah. You know, because everything else is calm and smooth and then you have this this rigid, you know, fence and yet it's see-through and it's, you know, you can tell it's been there a while. It kind of ebbs and flows and stuff. But to me, it, it's just, there's that, there's that contrast that it rolls into the sky that again is, is soft and, and comforting. So, um, and the, and the reflection from the, um, from the sky onto the lake. I mean, there's just so many details that, that I get captured um, by when I, you know, when I take the time to be still and really look 
And I think sometimes we just don't take the time to see what's before us. So I really appreciate someone with talent who can capture this. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you you spoke about the fence, you know, because seeing the condition of the fence, you know, and knowing the storms that the Outer Banks are always subject to every year. And, and you come to realize um, um, just how much that fence has witnessed over the years. Mm -hmm. Even though everything's calm right now, you know, that fence knows the history of that area with, when it comes to the storms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The engagement that we're doing right now, talking about your work, talking about the poem, talking about what we see. When I work with people uh, with various stages of dementia and I and I say I'm going to work with poetry, I'm often asked, well, how are you going to do that? And one way is to read a poem to someone and to feel their reaction, get their reaction, to have them look at a photograph or a painting and say, what do you see? And whatever they bring to that, we all see things differently, then that's a way to start a conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how poetry can work. And also if you can write poetry with dementia, having dementia, it's another way to create. But even if you can't, you can react to it. You can respond to the arts. And that's another form of arts engagement. A little, little bit off on a tangent. Um, I I host a group every couple of weeks for DAA. Um, it, before I was hosting it, it was called the Poetry Club. Now that I'm hosting it, it's called the Literature and Art Group. And exactly what you were saying, you know, we look at a we we'll look at a piece of art. Uh, last last time we met, we were um, taking a look at and discussing um, um, Edward Edward Munch's The Scream. And so we, we spent an hour discussing it. Now, in the meantime, between between then and when we meet again tomorrow, um, people will write either a short a short story based upon what, how they're interpreting what's happening in the scream, or if they're inspired to write some you know some lines of poetry. Um, they can bring they can bring that to our to our group uh, on Thursdays, and again, it, it's all it's designed to um, engage people, you know, in and get their brains challenging their brains to keep to keep processing and to keep working, um, you know, despite despite their their diagnoses. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I, and I think too, um, you know, with dementia, people learn to adapt and some people might not be able to write sentences or full prose. They might do, you know, haikus that are shorter, mm -hmm. or they might just have words. And when they yeah. read those words, there's power behind those individual words. And so, you know, there's, there's no limit in terms of how you can express things this one i love i, I just love the face <laughs> of this this bird like, what, what do you want now actually you should have seen the the uncropped image of uh -huh. that bird because there is a bl very dead very bloodied fish in front of him i'm assuming i was assuming it was his fish and that look on his face like i dare you to try to take that fish from me <laughs> That's great. Mary, any comments on this? I, I... Oh, no, it's just, it's funny. It, it's expressive. Uh, we can read into it. And I love the the, the, the lines of the uh, waves behind him that coming in and the shadow. Yeah, it's very, very um, evocative. It speaks. Yep. Don't touch it. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Whatever it is, don't touch it. Well, and I, you know, when I was looking at the waves, you know, a lot of times we see these like, you know, big, huge waves that you can see through. And these are, uh, these are more condensed and darker. And, you know, at first it's like, God, it almost looks like a jellyfish type quality, you know, mm -hmm. with, the, with the sparkle and stuff on it. Um, but I, I find that really interesting too, um, because everything takes a, a different shape there. Um, now here's another a beautiful, beautiful shot. Whereabouts is this one, Mark? 
That is the Boston skyline that taken from across the way in a town called Hull. Now, you notice the, the big robot looking structure. Mm -hmm. um, we used, growing up, we always would call it the robot. That's the air traffic control tower for Logan Airport. Oh, okay. And okay. kind of a little bit more difficult to see, but if you go to the right, it, um, okay, you see that in the water, there's, there's a few buoys. Mm -hmm. If you look above one of the buoys, you can just make out um, a bridge, like the trellis of a bridge. And that is the Mystic, Mystic Tobin Bridge in Boston. This is the view of Boston you hardly ever see. So I like that. Yeah, a lot of people like to go down to this spot um, in Hull um, because of these sunsets. They're, they, they can be so amazing. And I was actually coming, I was with someone, and we were coming home from spending an afternoon in Hull when I saw some cars pulled over, you know, just on the side of the road, not in a parking parking spot. So like I mentioned earlier, caused me to kind of turn around and look over my shoulder to see what they were looking at. Saw the sunset and I was just like, stop the car. I need to get this picture. <laughs> I didn't even get out of the car. All I had to do was lean out the window with my camera to get this shot. It's awesome. Patience. The beautiful and the enduring are nurtured over weeks, months, years. From nature to relationship, time spent endures, endears. A piece of jagged glass must tumble o'er and o'er in the sea to become a piece of lovely sea glass an artist's eyes can see. The couple at the beach waiting on the colors of the setting sun Sit quietly as time passes, knowing its value when the day is done. Flowers do not bloom or night, nor wisdom come from youth. With time, the garden is a beautiful sight, and to the elder comes the truth. Beautiful. Now, Mark, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, this um, this kind of, is this, I'm assuming this is a sunset. Mm -hmm. um, do you alter the colors at all, or is this all natural? Unless there was the the, the cactus photo I altered, um, I try not to have to alter okay. the actual colors. Mm -hmm. I may, uh, you know, tweak the the brightness or the contrast a little bit on them, but I I, I really because you do face as a photographer, I do face that skepticism sometimes you know oh this is ai or oh you know what did you you know you that you obviously had to do something with the colors so so i like to be able to say you know with honesty that no i really didn't do anything with the colors except you know tweak the brightness or the or the contrast a little bit okay well and you know and i love the title to this poem the patience because it does you know, when you're patient, you see so much more, you take mm -hmm. so much more in, in just terms of, of looking, you know, ahead. And there is a, a variety of detail from, you know, the, the ripples on the, on the lake or the river, um, whichever this is, um, you know, the bridge, the, the, the siloed buildings, the tree line, the, the buoys, um, the clouds, the lighting. I mean, there's just, um, there's just so much in here when you're, when you're patient. So it's a beautiful match. So thank you. Thank you. Um, here's another one. And I loved this one. Um, this one, again, for anyone listening to the podcast, you probably want to come back and mm -hmm. watch the video here. Um, but it's just uh, set in um, this beautiful colored foliage. And then it's a kind of an, an old fallen leaf um, with a heart cut out of it, you know, by nature. And it's pretty profound um, the way it pops. So tell us a little bit more about this one, Mark. Sure. So I do have an affinity for, for lighthouses. Mm -hmm. um, I also have just kind of an ongoing project 
that I'm always on the lookout for what I call hearts in nature. Um, I've found rocks like boulders. I have a picture of a boulder with a heart shaped naturally cut out of the cut into it. Um, this leaf is a, is another example. Um, you know, I was on a, a nature trail during the fall. So, you, so got the beautiful fall colors and some with a couple of leaves that haven't quite turned yet. And this old dead leaf sitting on top of the foliage uh, with, with the natural shape of a heart mm -hmm. carved out of the middle of it. So, yeah, it's beautiful. The colors are dynamic. Um, and I love the little uh, dew drop on the leaf or maybe it's water from rain or something, which just adds to it. It's it's quite brilliant and it's it's also peaceful though. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, this um, I, you know, and I didn't really notice the dew drop on there until you you mentioned that, and then it's like, oh yeah, I can see that. I can see some other kind of dewy areas as well. You know, when I am patient and take the time to to look, so it's it's always neat to have this. You know, one side of me almost says, oh, this would be a cool one to title, you know, the heart of nature or hearts in nature, something like that. To, because there are probably a lot of people that wouldn't pick that up, you mm -hmm. know, and yet I think it's so important that they see the the natural beauty and the love within um, mm -hmm. that, again, sometimes is overlooked. So that's my two cents on that one. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Now here we've got a, another beautiful, beautiful setting. Um, whereabouts does this one take place? Um, where was that one? Oh, oh, okay. That was um, back when I was living in Maine, and that's a section of Acadia National Park. Mary, you want to comment on the on the photo and the poetry? I love the I love the two together. I've been to Arcadia. It's a, just a wonderful, beautiful place. This is. I love, I love this. Yeah. So the poem on this one says, let's take a walk along a distant shore, far away from distractions where we are free to explore. Let's take a walk hand in hand, speaking aloud our inner thoughts so our hearts will understand. Let's take a walk, stopping only for a kiss, appreciating the magic that between us exists. How gorgeous is that? I'm getting emotional on that one. <laughs> It's beautiful, you know, and you look at the scene and you have, you know, I love the rocks, you know, in, in on the shoreline and you, I mean, there's just so much texture in this one. You've got the, the clear blue sky with just a few, few little clouds in there. You have the wooded area on the other shoreline that you can see, you know, a beach and a few houses, but then you have these, you know, um, pine you know i don't know if they're pine trees um and you know that are are just thick and some of them don't necessarily look overly um healthy or strong but together they just stand out and it's just it's it's such a gorgeous scene and it just reminds me and again through your verbiage of all that life has to offer and some of it is smooth and some of it is ragged and jaggedy, but together, you know, we get through and um, uh, beautiful. Thank you. It makes me think of, um, again, the idea of storytelling. Just by looking at this, we can imagine your poem enhances the story for us. But uh, if you're listening and you're saying, well, I'm a caregiver, a person I'm working with with dementia, uh, can't do photography or I don't have the supplies or whatever, open a book of photography and just say, what, what is, what do you see? Mm -hmm. And stories will, will emerge mm -hmm. no matter if they're abstract, if they make sense to you or not, everyone can react and share what they see. And that in itself is such a beautiful way to connect and communicate. Like right now, we're all looking at this and we're thinking our own thoughts. Um, it doesn't take a lot to get our our self-expression uh, up and running. Mm -hmm. This is one way to do it. And you'll see, you'll you'll probably 
noticed that um, a lot of the the metaphors I use in my uh, poetry has to do with that connection to the sea, oceans, boats. Um, and then just a, a quick commentary on, on my poetry in general. With, with a few exceptions, most of my poems have uh, two inspirations. One, especially this one, um, was uh, uh, a woman that was in my life for a while, but sad to say is, is you know, we've gone our separate ways. Um, and then um, I'm also inspired to write about my son who passed away next month to, or September. It'll be two years ago that um, uh, my youngest son passed away from mental illness. And I've written several poems uh, to and about him just as a way to help process the grief. Wonderful. And we'll we'll get to some of those poems here um, shortly. This one I love, especially with the 4th of July. This one, you know, is just roasting a marshmallow over the fire. Um, it looks like a young gal, you know, yep. stick with the marshmallow. You don't see the face. You don't, you know, you just focus or I focus on the fire and the marshmallow and those kind of, I, I say anxious hands awaiting <laughs> the treat. <laughs> what was your thought in capturing this one, Mark? I, I do not like portrait photography in general um back in those days that i was dabbling laurie and mary um i did offer my services as a portrait photographer and it just really disheartened me and had made me put my camera down and leave it put away for for many years um because you can never please the entire group when you're taking pictures of a of a group at a family reunion, let's say, or a wedding, let's say, because there's always, you know, oh, little little Tom, Tommy was, had a funny look on his face. Well, I can't control that. So if I get, if I take pictures of people, they tend to be more candid, like they weren't expecting me to take a photo and, and I'm able to get, um, more more natural expressions um this photograph that that little girl is now a teenager um I'm, I'm very close to their family up in new hampshire and um uh, her name is zoe and this was just outside uh, i hadn't seen the family for many many years after i moved to arizona so when i moved back to new england this was one of the the first um, um, times I had reconnected with this family, and we were had a little bonfire going outside and toasting marshmallows. So, so I I, I stood behind or I stood in front of her and and snapped this picture because I could see how um, the flames, how you could see through the flames, and I thought this would be a a really cool. Uh, perspective if I could pull it off. That's yeah, beautiful. Mary, thoughts? Yeah, it's a unique shot. The fact that the flames are transparent is just very gripping to me. Um, I love the angles, the fact that some of it is uh, not in focus. Just This is just a unique perspective on just an everyday a thing that people do. And the colors, I really like it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And that's another one where I took it, I took the camera at a different angle, you know, down, down low, looking up. And this one, I, this one, I just am in awe of. Um, do you want to explain this one? This is one that when I have it up displayed in a gallery, people find it hard to believe that I didn't alter. Mm -hmm. mm. This was how it looked shot through the camera. That is the, grand prismatic spring at yellowstone national park and those are the colors that you see from time to time it's all because of all the sulfur and other chemicals that that are naturally in these hot springs um from day to day you're going to get different expressions of different colors and um when this was shot 
when I decided to move back to New England from Arizona, it was a direct result of getting my diagnosis and suddenly feeling like I needed to come home and New England was home. Um, so, you know, sold most of my possessions. I was driving a pickup truck. So it was just me, my dog in the passenger seat and what I a uh, black Labrador and what I could fit in the back of a pickup truck. And we drove cross country um, tent tent camping in national parks all the way to, back to New England. And um, this was one of our first stops was Yellowstone. And in preparing to visit Yellowstone, you know, everybody talks about Old Faithful. They want to they want to see Old Faithful. When I was when I was doing my research on what I wanted to see at Yellowstone, I kind of said, you know, the heck with old, the, you know, seeing seeing a geyser going off every hour. I want to see the Grand Prismatic Spring, mm -hmm. and uh, the the fo I've, I've, I took several photographs um, from different locations all around the Grand Prismatic Spring, and and it was breathtaking. Wow, yes, the reflection. What time of day was this? Ooh. It looks like dawn or dusk. I, um, it was early morning. Early morning. Early yeah. morning, yeah. Thank you for telling me about the Grand Prismatic Spring because I've been to Yellowstone. I didn't even know about it. And oh, I, wow. of course, I went to see the guys. This was many years ago. But um, I'm planning to go back again with my husband. This is going to be on the top of my list because this is just so dynamic and mysterious and beautiful. Thank yeah. you. It, re it really is. The colors are just so intriguing, you know, with the ground. And then you've got the yellow and the green and kind of this misty fog and the the you know, tree line um, in the back. And yeah, it's it's really something. And I've got, you know, and, and that just happens to be what the colors looked like from that angle. Mm -hmm. A little ways down the dock, the dock that you have to walk along. Um, you know, I turned again to get a picture of it. And now the colors had more magentas and reds in them. Mm -hmm. So so it, it took my breath away that that whole spring. It kind of reminds me in a way of the Northern Lights. Mm -hmm. And I love the silhouette of the mountain in the background. And yet in the reflection, it's not in silhouette. You see the the colors on it. It's a, it's really, um, again, a unique shot of an area that perhaps people don't, don't often see. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. And I thought this was really cool too. Um, you want to explain where this is? That is in Lincoln, New Hampshire, um, um, from three years ago. Mm -hmm. And an, another um, perspective that I'm always on the lookout for is um, photographs of perfect reflections. So, so I, I took this shot because I saw what the how the reflection of the windmill, uh, not the the water wheel, uh, looked in the, in the water. Um, What's mysterious about this is that you've got the symmetry of the reflection. It's as if you could cut it in half, like a Rorschach almost. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at the flowers in the lower left, and I'm thinking. Wait a minute! I don't see those <laughs> above. How come they're not also? I'm realizing that it's it's in the only in the picture, of course, near the water. But I, my my mind wants to see a total um, reflection of everything, and that's I like that. I was yeah. trying to think uh, what else what that location is is all about. Um, there's a tourist attraction called Franconia Notch. And that's where where this was located near, where the old man of the mountain used to be until until that rock rock face formation collapsed. Okay, yeah, I I love the 
the red against the the shed kind of there in the background um, of this, you know, water wheel. And then it's muted in the water, but yet it's so exacting. And, you know, I just look at even the spokes inside the wheel, very different in the water than I see on, on land mm -hmm. um, in terms of how I interpret how it would, you know, how it would run. Um, so yeah, and I, I too, I like the, the contrast with the, the flowers and the greenery as well. This one, I, I, I just love the, the puff dead dandelions, you know, and flowers here. So every time I see those, I just, I just want to blow on them and make them, you know, poof all over. Where, where was this and what made you decide to capture this one? That was on a, a local trail um, here in my town. And this is a different style of photography. Um, you know, I, I do a lot of landscapes. I do uh, the lighthouses. Um, but with this shot, I was working at working with macro photography, um, which requires a different way of thinking. So again, you know, I'm challenging my brain to think a different way because because you need to control your depth of field, meaning purposely making the background out of focus like I did, so that you're only focusing on the 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 dandelion head um, otherwise had i left everything in, in focus uh, in my opinion really would have really would have lost the dandelion because you've got the dominating greens and yellows in the background um, and and to achieve that effect um you know you you control depth of field through your lens with um um, specific aperture settings for your lens combined with uh, the the shutter speed. So a lot of a lot of uh, calculation has to go in into it, which you know when you're when you're dealing with a an inanimate subject matter, you know you I can take the time to 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 figure out, okay, what's the best way to to set my aperture to get this desired effect? It's interesting for me too, is when I look at this, my, you know, my eyes always kind of go right to left and it just pulls my eye right over. And I find it interesting that you offset it to the side versus mm -hmm. centering it. Cause a lot of people would have just centered it. And it, is that, was that purposeful or is that mm -hmm. just the way the picture you took? No, that was purposeful. I have another shot um, of this same um, subject where I did perfectly center it. And in photography, they, they have a, a concept called the rule of eights mm -hmm. and it dividing up the frame into eight segments. Um, um, oftentimes when I'm out there with my camera, I always feel that rule, those rules are made to be broken. <laughs> So, so I'll often, I'll often do something like that, you know, against the norm, against the expected. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes I like the results. Sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. So technically I'm guessing when you started photography back in, I guess you said high school, was it? Uh, first semester of college. College. Uh, was there digital photography or did you actually do the dipping of the pictures in the dark room? And now I'm guessing you're working all digitally. Correct. Okay. Um, for a little while, when I was, when I lived in New Hampshire shortly after I got married, um, um, I was working at a one hour photo lab and through the customers there, the regulars, um, I was able to um, get a job as a we had a small weekly newspaper, and you know I could take my own photos and submit them as a freelance photographer, um, you know, to get byline credit underneath the photo in the weekly newspaper. But that opened the door for me for them to hire me on as their their darkroom person. So 
it was like every Sunday morning, I'd drive over to their darkroom and collect all the rolls of film that their staff photographers had shot during the week. And, you know, dipping and, yeah, all of doing doing all of that to to uh, process their photos and and it's funny that was 1989 1990 thereabouts and when I talk about that I can still I still swear I can smell those chemicals mm -hmm. yes <laughs> I, I took a class or two in that setting and it wasn't easy it was a lot of steps. Not that digital photography in a creative sense is not various steps, as you mentioned, different apertures, et cetera, but such a different world than we live in now. And it's it's much more comforting now, um, you know, because I do, you know, I'm showing you today some of, some of the highlights of the shots I, I like, but there's lots and lots of, of mistakes I've made, you know, photos that just don't come out right or, and, um, um, you know, a lot of times that's kind of due to my state of mind that day with my symptoms and, and, but what's nice about digital is I don't have to wait till the film gets developed to see if I had a problem shooting that subject mm -hmm. right there exactly. in my camera. And because it's all digital now, I can shoot seven, eight, nine, ten photos at different settings of the same subject to make sure that one of them is going to be the right one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. Um, Ansel, Ansel Adams had a, uh, a, a well, probably had lots of quotes, but there's one quote by Ansel Adams that um, always encourages me when I start to get frustrated by, you know, going through a stretch where I don't get any quality images. Um, he once said that his goal when, when he was taken, everybody, you both know, remember who Ansel Adams was before? I, yes. Okay. Famous so, right. So his he always said that his goal was to have shoot one marketable photo every month. Mm -hmm. Just one. Wow. You know, he could take hundreds of photos, but he was only looking for that one every month that, that would be good enough to market. And so I, I try to tell myself, you know, if that's if that was good enough for Ansel Adams, then you know, stop getting so worked up over, you know, 20 photos on this photo shoot that didn't come out right. Yep. Good advice. Yeah, very. This one is cool, too. So why don't you explain this one? This is hybrid photography. The The moon was not there. I added the moon. And, um, yeah, I added the, 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 the yellow as well. Uh, the subject is the Troga, T-R-O-G-A, Pinnacles in uh, near Death Valley, California. Um, a lot of uh, car, a lot of commercials for like your off-road cars riding around. It's, it's to show, show everybody on TV just how versatile they are and how powerful they are. They, they they videotape a lot of these car commercials here in the Pinnacles. And um, I was there. See, I was still living in Arizona. So that was taken probably around 2014 or 2015. And there wasn't a lot to this photo when I got it home to looking at it on my computer. So rather than chalk it up to a bad photo and a throwaway and, and, you know, I decided, well, see how I can manipulate it, see what I can, you know, do with my hybrid photography and try to create something, something unique, something one of a kind. And, and this was the result for that one. Otherworldly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the contrast with the yellow. And the, the moon, you know, just is intriguing in sitting there. And then, you you know, you see the, the sunlight coming through, through the, the clouds. And then you have the, the starkness and the heaviness of just the rock in the formation 
you know, in and of itself there. Um, here's another one. It looks like you you um, did a hybrid. You want to explain yep. this one? Uh, the only piece of that photo that was in the original is that tree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the planets were added. The sky was replaced. And yeah, I wanted to give it, I wanted to create something that was otherworldly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can imagine being, that's the planet Jupiter. So I can imagine standing on one of the moons of Jupiter, looking up at the sky and this being what I see in the sky. Okay. Thoughts, Mary? Also very painterly as well. Mm. I like yeah. it. Yeah, it reminds me of something out of a sci-fi movie, you know, mm -hmm. where the aliens are coming, you know, and the sky is <laughs> changing. That's what it makes me think of. Okay, now here's another one um, with a beautiful, beautiful poem on it. This one says, with each sun that rises, hope is renewed. Hearts are awakened and thoughts are construed. With each sun that rises, dreams are reviewed. Gratitude is acknowledged and goals are pursued. And um, this is just like the dawning of a new day. You know, like, don't give up no matter how bad things are. There is there's beauty to behold. There is always hope um, in the horizon. And, you know, to me, it's just a real powerful statement of don't ever let go of that hope and those dreams. When you captured this, what were your thoughts, Mark? That's one of the oldest photos I have in my portfolio. Um, was never actually in my portfolio. It was just kind of a throw, one that I threw aside. Mm -hmm. um, um, it was taken in Arizona in the town that I lived in, in uh, Prescott, Arizona. About 2013, I would guess. Now, this process that I've started doing this year with adding my poetry to the photos, um, I've kind of taken it, taken the approach in two different ways. Um, I have quite a collection of poems that I've written uh, over, uh, over the last year. And so on the one hand, I look at photos that I have that have enough blank space in them, like this photo here, the 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 sky takes up a lot of the, the photograph. So there was a lot of room to work with as far as superimposing um, a poem. So that's one of the considerations I have for when I'm looking for photographs to put a poem on. Um, and I'm at the same time, checking the poems I've wrote, I, that I previously wrote to see if there's one that kind of makes sense to match with this photo. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, and this this why I'm explaining this now is this is an example of of a different approach. Um, again, this photo has quite a bit of sk dead space in the sky. You know, the sky taking up two thirds of the photograph. But I really couldn't find a poem that I wanted to add to it that I had already written. So I took time to be inspired by the image itself to create something just for that image. And that's what this this four line poem isn't in my co collection of poems. Um, it's it was something that that I wrote just for this photograph. Mary. It's yeah, I love the, ch the choice of the yellow in the writing because it's as if the sun is projecting these words in the color of the sun. Mm. And it's that just makes me feel like it's a beam of message from the sun. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see that. Almost makes me think, wish now that maybe I could have... Uh, centered the poem more over the sun so that you'd have more of that direct effect of the sun's rays giving off that poem. Well, I would like to say I like it like this because uh, you've got the diagonal, the, the visual diagonal from the upper left to the lower right, and the poem helps us to see that, to move okay. there. So, yeah, it's, it's mysterious in that sense as opposed to like just what might be more 
realistic. So I I like it this way, but then okay. again, you know, you're the artist, but, but everyone sees it differently. But, but this, it, yeah. I, but, this but it wasn't one of my favorite photo, photos either. You know, it, I really had nothing, you know, this photo wasn't included in any, any of my shows until I found something to write to put with it. Mm -hmm. You take so that works. away, you take that away, and it's just one of hundreds of sunrise or sunset photos that I have. <laughs> that, and it works both ways. You can write a poem and then make a painting or a drawing or a picture that reflects it if you choose, or you could have a picture or a, photo a photograph and write, and write to it. Another mm -hmm. way to creatively uh, go a different direction. This one I just love. It just, it you know, um, it's a watering can, you know, with wildflowers in it. And it's just these bright colors, but it's just, you know, it just screams spring. And then it looks like a little bird's nest mm -hmm. on the table that's sitting next to it and kind of a, um, you know, a weathered um, wood uh, kind of shingle, um, almost like cedar, it looks like um, on there. It just, and then the window, but it's just this, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. To me, it's a really, really peaceful, calming shot and um, full of hope as well with that. And curious touches. One of the shingles is off on one side, oh, yeah. the white spot. The window is not looking in a window. It's a reflection, I'm guessing, of what's outside. Yeah. And then that little nest, I mean, I want to guess that that's a hummingbird nest. It's so small. You're but, probably right. But so there's these, It's. I agree with you, Laurie, it's so beautiful and bright. And then there's these little touches that make me curious about what are those and why? Mm -hmm. So uh, you'll recall the photograph of the young girl with the toasting the marshmallow. This is the same house. Um, different, different time. Um, uh, after, after my son passed away, my friend who lives in this house up in New Hampshire drove down. She been friends with with this family for close to forty years, so they're like a brother and sister to me more than friends. Mm -hmm. And when she and she's the the wife. Um, is God godmother to all of my children, including the one that passed. When I called her, she was my first call after finding out finding out the news, and she drove down and immediately drove down, picked me up and brought me back so that you know I could be around around support. Um, I had an old friend because I used to live in that town. So while I was there, another old friend wanted to come over and, and, you know, sit with me and offer condolences and all that. Well, when we were, uh, when we used to hang around back in the nineties, this friend, one of the things we liked to do was uh, go to a local nursery and just walk through the greenhouses and admire the different plants and the flowers. So she took it upon herself to pick up a, a bouquet of wildflowers to remind me of that of that time in in our lives and and my friend that lives in that house just happened to have a watering can sitting on the table so she's the the friend that brought the flowers said oh perfect and she just dropped them in <laughs> and i'm i'm just this and so i've had this in my show and in my portfolio for you know a year and a half now and i've been floored by just how popular it seems to be i've i've sold several greeting cards with this image on it i've sold different sizes you know matted photos with this image on it and it's like oh i just wanted it in there because it kind of was a a subtle reminder about my son mm -hmm. but other people really like it <laughs> yeah but to me it, it represents um how life we can feel weathered kind of like the siding you know you can see the the, the painter the stain that is um, chipped off and yet the beauty of nature that is abound and like Mary said with the window it's kind of tilted out so it really is reflective 
of, you know, what we don't see, you know, with all this foliage and the, and the tree leaves and things like that. Um, so it's just, it's really, it's very interesting, but to me, it, it all balances out. And again, it's um, hopeful and joyful um, mm. that just because something has rough edges doesn't mean that there's not beauty in it and um, that it's not, you know, can't be surrounded and be, be part of that. I think sometimes, especially nowadays, everybody's looking for everything to be perfect and, you know, perfect um, loses a lot of depth in terms of, of reality, in, in my personal opinion. And so I really appreciate all the different factors um, that are that are in here. So thank you mm -hmm. again. This, um, this isn't, it's for me, as we you tell the story, it's an emotional type of feeling for me. Uh, something's missing on the home, the piece of shingle, the nest is empty. And yet mm. nature, yet nature sustains and it sustains us in its beauty and comforts us. That's nice. Now, this one's interesting because it's very different. It's not out in nature. It's stark black, um, but a picture of a city with its with its lights on. So why don't you talk about this one and, and uh, why you captured this, what you were drawn to? <laughs> uh, this is in Boston. That is the State Street Bank building. Um, I used to work for State Street Bank for a couple of years. What's amazing about this shot is, to me anyways, is that where I was situated was miles away. I'm walking, it was at night, obviously, and I'm walking to a car. I had um, gone to, to an exhibit, a Van Gogh exhibit in Boston, with a friend and we're walking to the car and it caught my eye for, for a minute. And I had to kind of backtrack a couple of steps because I could only see this, this shot. Like I said, it was, it was a, several miles away and through in between buildings that were closer to me. Mm -hmm. So, so it was a, it was a very narrow um, shot for me to to take. So I I did the best I could on the you know on the fly. I took took a quick photograph of it, and when I got home, I was able to crop the two buildings that were in the foreground out of the photograph, and then really zoom in, crop and zoom to to capture capture this nighttime city scene i i love it it's it's like as if it's floating in darkness and i almost i see like on the left hand side well on the one of the sides i see like a little a man made of dots like a robot a little man oh. who's kind of standing there with his arms out to the side like just a person in that does anybody oh. see that I say one that reminds me of like a Pac-Man type person, but <laughs> I'm not sure. a head and a whole body and his like long arms as if his shoulder arms are four arms are hanging and oh yeah, yeah, I see it now. You see him? He's still <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I like the the different colors, you know, of the um of the windows, the the bright um white and then you've got you know kind of this muted yellow and there's blue and there's red and some are squares some are circles you know it's it's just really it's it's interesting kind of hit and miss mm -hmm. um but you know that something substantial is standing in the darkness even though you can't see it all now here is um, one of your poems, um, a brief ode to new life. Is this one that you'd like to read or? Sure. So um, recently a friend of mine became a grandmother again, and she put on social media um, the photo of her holding, holding the newborn you know, for that the first time. And the smile on the, on my friend's face just just really inspired me to to write this poem it's called a brief ode to new life 
Once upon a day when the sunlight's end came early, a new soul decides to begin his outward journey. He announces his arrival with cries of victory, ready to add his name to his family tree and future history. Loved ones feeling love deeply and profound, their hearts overflowing with warmth that knows no bounds. That love and warmth shines through the smiles on their faces as they hold him, swaddle him, shower him with praises. His proud mother lays in bed, weary from her task. Though thoroughly exhausted, her joy cannot be masked. His proud father sits beside the two, attentive with his love, a family's newborn, firstborn child, the start of what dreams are made of. Wow. I like that a lot. Thank you. I have two new grandchildren, so I really can uh, understand that. Very nice. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. It's like any parent or grandparent gets that. Um, someone who hasn't experienced either of those might not to mm -hmm. the same extent. Um, but it, you know, you describe it beautifully, um, which is very sweet. Thank very you. Very sweet. Now, here's oh, one. Okay. Mm -hmm. A violin speaks. Mm -hmm. Gives me chills. <clears throat> Backstory. Time to tell a story. Um, my son was a uh, uh, child prodigy. Um extremely gifted intellectually, while also extremely gifted musically. And um, while he could play, you hand him any instrument and within 10 or 15 minutes, he figured out how to play it. His instrument of choice was the violin. And um, once he became an adult, he chose to live a life on the streets, a life on the road, um, and that was his, you know, due to his mental illness. Um, but he always, he always had a, his violin with him unless it got stolen and then I'd find a way to get him money so he could buy a new one. But he, he always had his violin with him. And um, I imagined as a way of processing the grief I felt on that day, April 9th, 2023, when I wrote this poem, um, you know, because because grief isn't a linear process. It doesn't go from A to Z and then you're done. You know, it, it ebbs and flows always. And, and especially losing a child, um, it's you don't get over it. It's just something you need to learn how to sit beside, sit beside that grief. Um, and but there are going to be days when you feel like you're, you're drowning in the drowning in the grief again. And on April 9th, 2023, um, I found myself in a in a vulnerable state. But instead of writing it in writing, expressing my emotions in first person, I thought to ascribe those emotions and those feelings to my son, Joey's violin, because, you know, the violin was the closest Joey had to a companion in his, in his uh, adult life, his brief adult life. So a violin speaks standing alone, leaning propped up against the wall. My voice now silent when it once filled the hall waiting for my ally, my friend who made me sing, the one whose fingers held my bow, whose fingers touched my strings. Beautiful music we made together, but alas, never again I fear, for so much time has passed. My strings and body gathering dust with each passing day. Where has he gone? Why won't he take me out to play? So many travels, so many adventures, the two of us entwined. Hiking, walking, riding the rails, it was forever, he and I. I was with him as he grew in talent and in age. I gave him confidence when he took any stage. I miss my boy. I wonder where and why he's gone. 
and why this time he didn't take me along. No one else will hold me the way that he did. Without him, I can't sing or live. Instead, I only exist in silent torture, missing my boy, my love, my brilliant performer. So, yeah, so that's his violin speaking as an outlet for what I was feeling. I said, well, I sure felt it. I got tears just streaming down my face. Um, it's beautiful. It's it's so powerful and loving and asking of the questions of why is life like this? You know, what happened? And so often we don't have the answer. If I can digress for a minute. The last time I, I spoke with, with Joey was um, six days before his suicide. And... He had called me from the road like he, he always kept in touch. He just never wanted to be under a roof for any length of time. So he had called me six days before. And the one thing I, re I remember observing in that phone call, he was so crystal clear. He wasn't. Joey was a schizophrenic, untreated schizophrenic um, with addiction problems. So, but that last phone call, it was, it was old Joey. There was, there was, he, he was, he was sober. Um, there were no voices in his head going on. He was very coherent and, and it was a really encouraging conversation I was, that, that I had with him. And, um, um, I had actually, just started into that relationship with that woman that I'm no longer in a relationship with and was uh, exuberantly telling my, telling Joey about this, this new woman in my life. And six days before he takes his own life, he's telling me, you know, dad, I haven't, I haven't heard you this happy in so many years. He says, I can't wait to meet her. And, and, you know, at least the last thing we said to each other was, was I love you. Um, you know, and that was, that was a regular thing. We would always end our phone calls with, with, I love you. But six days before he's talking about looking forward to meeting this new woman in my life to deciding to take his own life. And, you know, I'm forever left wondering what happened in those six days and, and why didn't he call me? Because, whenever whenever his mental illness would start to overwhelm him he would call me and we'd talk and i talk him you know till he calmed down and and you know so so i'm left wondering to myself you know first off what happened in those 6 days and then it's the you know joey you know why didn't you call me you know, I would move mountains if you needed help. This is, uh, first of all, thank you, Mark, for sharing this very intimate and profound poem with us. Grief is something that we all find at times in our lives we have to we have to face. And I, I really like your concept of we must sit beside it. We can't get through it. We find a way to sit beside it and writing or even painting or any other art is also a way to deal with grief. And you handle this so uh, specifically, giving the violin voice, personifying the violin, but also in a way it's a persona poem, giving yourself voice uh, to him and to, to the circumstance just by separating yourself enough, you're able to, you were able, it seems to me, to be able to put these emotions and this longing and these questions in the voice of the violin, his most uh, closest um, living thing, because instruments are living things. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that you've helped anyone, anyone watching, listening, who has had a moment of grief, a lifetime of remembrance. 
through this poem, through tears that may have brought to their eyes, and also the fact that they can also use writing to help to cope and sit beside this, this grief. Thank you so much for reading this and for writing this. It's because of um, Joey and um, you know, it, because of Joey mainly that I've started advocating for mental health and homelessness in addition to dementia. Good for you. And and I try to. After Joey passed away, I. I did enter a dark space in my head for a while and I got help and learned um, many coping skills. And in our groups with DAA, although where we try to be narrowly focused on dementia issues, I often try to incorporate uh, mental health messages um, in the discussions as well. Um, talk about one thing I learned in in my own uh, therapy program was was keeping a toolbox, a mental toolbox of different tools, different coping skills, um, so that when when you do all of a sudden feel grief, feel the grief again, you've got things you can reach for. You've got tools in that toolbox that you can try to use to, to address it. And okay, maybe that, maybe you pull a tool, a mental health tool out of the toolbox that really doesn't help the situation. Well, all right, put that one back in the toolbox and pull something else out. It, it, it's a matter of filling that toolbox with, with um, options. So, so that you can, um, restore your own mental health that's wise and you know it, it's on the rise at all ages um mental health you know needs to be addressed it makes me think of a piece that i bought in a silent auction um that was um, sketched by a homeless person mm -hmm. and it was the, one of the most profound sketches i've seen of mother Teresa, and well, it's that's... absolutely gorgeous and it was sad because you know, I'm like, who, who was the artist, you know, and then to hear it was just like, oh, my gosh, this talent, you know, and I, I always think and, and I could be wrong, but I think so, so much of the time um, with mental illness, I think people don't feel valued. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't feel like they fit in. And I'm like, oh, my, this should, you know, his work should be on exhibit. I mean, the talent here is off the charts. And yet it's not recognized all the time with people. And, and people need to realize that, um, you know, there is, there is a connection. Um, when, when someone is diagnosed with a mental illness by their early twenties, tw they are four times more likely to develop dementia in middle age. If that diagnosis of mental illness is, um, uh, a type of schizophrenia that they're diagnosed with, then those statistics jump to six times more likely to develop dementia. Wow. So, you know, so while we can't cure dementia, we can treat mental health yep. and mental yes. illness. And, and that would go a long ways toward curtailing, you know, the, the, the numbers, the number of people diagnosed with dementia later in life. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we've got, here's another one of your poems about Joey. Do you want to read this one? This was the first one I wrote after, um, I actually wrote wrote this while I was in in therapy after, to, after Joey died. Um, everybody loved his blue eyes. Everyone said, would say, you know, I've never seen anybody with eyes as blue as his. And I always had in my head, I could see there was a comparison in my head to the lyrics of 
um, the song Vincent by Don McLean that he wrote about Vincent Van Gogh. Yes. And so, you know, Eyes of China Blue. My son had Eyes of China Blue. My son, because of his lifestyle living on the streets, he had raggedy clothes. Um, they were both Van Gogh and my son, different mediums, but they were both artists. So, so this poem really, when I finally, when I sat down and said, I, I need to get this poem out, it was it, the only poem so far that I actually wrote nonstop. I wrote the whole thing in one sitting in about five minutes. So it, I called it Joey. <clears throat> My son with eyes of China blue, troubled mind, but his spirit true. Wanderlust took him across our land, stopping on occasion, playing with or without a band. His violin he could make sing. Listening to him was a beautiful thing. That raggedy young man in his raggedy old clothes often fought battles with imaginary foes. When he lost that last fight, it cost him his life. His imaginary foe had him use a very real knife. Always on my mind, forever in my heart. Joey, my son, you will always be a part of me. I love you. You said this was influenced by uh, the song Vincent. Yes. Uh, you know, you could actually, at least the first, part of this, sing these lyrics, these words to that. My son of eyes of China blue, trouble mine in his spirit true. One, it fits yeah, the yeah. Interest, yeah, that's interesting that you pointed that out. I had never, I had never done that, but I had never seen that before. Maybe listen to it and, and then maybe the whole thing matches, but. I do have, I and maybe maybe subconsciously subliminally that was at work because I know I do have other poems that I can almost sing to another song that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Um, you know, I've written a couple of poems that have a very Eminem hip hop beat to it. <laughs> I can imagine singing it in the in the manner of Eminem and. So, try, yeah. try them out. Even this one, which is uh, sad and yet very yeah. beautiful. You know, when we started this interview, I noticed you had a musical note uh, hanging on your neck. And yes, on a chain. And I'm thinking that maybe now I understand it. You want to tell us about it? It has it has a little bit of Joey's ashes in it. Mm. So I sh never take it off. I shower with it. I fight with the doctors if I have to go, go to the hospital for things. And even through airport security, they can't make me take this off. Well, in wrapping up, I, I can't thank you enough, Mark. This has just been absolutely brilliant. We have more of Mark's poems that we'll be um, putting in the, the notes. We'll refer where you can get those. Um, we'll have it on our um, blog post on Alzheimer Speaks as well, but we'll direct you to um, exactly where you can read some of his other poetry and uh, we'll have his his pictures and things in the art gallery as well and we really encourage people to to share this to inspire people to give them hope and and I hope that you enjoyed our conversation you know as we explored Mark's art I um, you know for me it was really emotional at times but you know that's the beauty of art you know, and, um, and so, you know, some people will go, what's she crying? Uh, you know, why doesn't she cut that out? And it's like, cause that's real life. You know, that's what art does. And it's okay. I think to have emotions and there be people that disagree with that. That's fine. Um, but I, I think art is such a powerful medium, not only for those of us that are viewing or taking it in, but for the creators as well. I just think it's so healing. So, so thank you um, very much. Mary, any last comments from you? Uh, I agree. We can uh, release our emotions through art and, of course, through tears. Mm -hmm. It's a way to, to do this. Um, as always, Mark and Lori, I learn from our guests. Um, I've learned about photography. I've learned many things in this conversation, uh, and I hope that if you're listening, that you will take some of these ideas with you and know that um, art 
can help us to thrive in life. Exactly. And you had mentioned the tears, but we also mentioned about the peacefulness, the calmness, the joy, you know, it's, it's all of those things and what you read in and what you see um, from, you know, what is before us and having the patience, like one of his poems says, you know, to just see and really take in what's, what's before you. Mark, any last comments from you? Well, I want to thank you both for inviting me on and um, um, allowing me to share my photography and share my thoughts through my, po my, my poetry with you. And, you know, to allow me to talk about my son, because um, even as recent as last night, I, I had somebody comment to me that, you know, started talking about my son and uh, then apologized for talking about about him because he's passed. And, and, you know, the way I look at it is as long as we're still talking about Joey, he's still alive. And and so I, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to not only talk about the art, uh, but also to talk about my son. Yeah. Well, you know, what what a powerful man that he was and the impact that he's had and still carrying on um, through your through your voice and um, your advocacy, which, you know, I think we all need to jump on that bandwagon of mental health. Um, it's important. We can't just push it away or or move people off the street and pretend like they this isn't this doesn't exist. It does. Just yeah. just like with you know dementia, the the big stigma of be living with dementia, you know the, there's just as as difficult uh, stigmas living with mental illness, and um, you know people need to know that it's okay not to feel okay, that it's okay to talk about mental health, um, and to you know remember that mental health is health and and there's no shame in, in needing help exactly. and i would like to say to you mark keep making your art but you know what i don't think i need to say that because it looks like you can't help yourself <laughs> and i love that i love that You're an inspiration to all thank you mary yeah you're welcome and again i want to thank our partners again like click and share spread the word there is hope abound all over thanks everyone Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.